I'm Jonathan Larson with TYT, and we're still getting lots of details on the shootings this weekend in Dayton, in El Paso. The political response is still coming in, so things are kind of fast moving, and I don't want to get ahead of the ball on any of these things, but I do want to talk about a common thread that we see throughout, uh, or don't see throughout, these post-shooting discussions that never seems to really get interrogated in a meaningful way. and. Uh, I want to be clear that I'm not endorsing a specific political path forward or anything like that. I really just want to call out the what to me is a sort of puzzling phenomenon of what we don't see in the gun debate afterwards. And it's common on both sides of the aisle. We see it from Democrats, we see it from Republicans, which is the idea that there's you can only do incremental gun control measures because you bump up against the Second Amendment. And that's where the conversation ends. So you bump up against the Second Amendment. And you get it in uh, that, that, that dynamic of bumping up into the second, against the Second Amendment. You get that in a variety of flavors, right? Um, Democrats, uh, gun, pro-gun control measures uh, proponents will say, well, you know, there's only so much we can do because of the Second Amendment. And uh, Republicans, or at least pro-gun, uh, anti-gun control politicians will say, that's against the Second Amendment. They're proud of it and they, they like it. And in neither case is, does the debate go beyond that. Republicans are almost never interrogated on, well, why? Why do you like that? Why is that freedom worth more than the freedoms we sacrifice with widespread guns? Um, certainly there are people in Dayton and El Paso who've lost all freedoms um, and there are people who lost those people who would be willing to sacrifice their freedom to own a gun to prevent this kind of thing from happening again. And on the Democratic side, in some ways it's even more mysterious. The, well, there's the Second Amendment, as if it's, as if the Second Amendment is a given, as if it's written in stone. What it's actually written in is a document that says, and if you don't like any of this, here's how to change it. And of course, <laughs> it's, it's an embodiment of that malleability of the Constitution because it's an amendment. It is, in and of itself, a change uh, to the original Constitution, which did not enshrine gun rights in any specific sense. What the Constitution does do is say, here's how to change me. And so I'm always kind of mystified when I see uh, supposed self-avowed um, opponents of guns, proponents of gun control, stop at that Second Amendment wall and say, instead of saying something along the lines of, right now the courts are obliged to strike down the laws that I want to pass because they do not pass constitutional muster. So therefore, I am going to undergo, uh, I'm going to try to build a movement to repeal the Second Amendment. We know how to do it. It involves state legislatures and the Congress, and I don't even know the mechanics, but the point is, it's pretty easy to look up. You don't have to know them off the top of your head. Just look it up and get to work. Um, and I'm not saying that's an easy thing to do. That's why the title of this commentary is simple, not easy. Uh, it's a, it would be a very difficult thing to do. It would, it would be a generational shift. But politicians alive and working today have seen generational shifts. They know what it takes to accomplish them. They've seen it on gay rights, they've seen it on smoking. Um, we've seen it in a number of different areas. So the idea that it's completely beyond the pale is sort of mystifying to me. If you're a Republican and you think the Second Amendment is holy, uh, explain why, right? Let's, let's have that discussion. And if you're a Democrat and you think the Second Amendment has become a problem in its current interpretation, I don't get why Democrats aren't out there saying, here's what we should replace it with. So uh, we're going to see, I suspect, a different kind of uh, gun debate today, if only because the initial uh, reporting on the, these two shootings really kind of jumbles up the political dynamics in a way that we haven't seen before in such sharp juxtaposition to each other that uh, I think it makes some of the old responses a little bit less feasible for the political folks out there who are going to be asked to talk about this. And so maybe we will see something new come out of it. But as long as no one, even the gun control proponents, is saying we need to think about the Second Amendment, uh, I'm going to remain mystified and the guns are going to remain readily available.
so not a terribly in-depth or profound commentary for me today, um, but one that I thought merited some discussion. So I'm going to switch on over to the chat box and see what you folks have to say. I'm curious what, what your feelings are about the Second Amendment debate in our culture or the lack thereof and, and uh, what you attribute it to and what you think about it. So let's see what you folks have to say. Uh, Andrew Polishak, I hope I'm saying that correctly, says, in addition to gun restrictions, can gun marketing be controlled like cigarettes? Yeah, I mean, there's no reason it can't be. Um, and if there's a Second Amendment defense against that, well, again, the, we've already talked about what that remedy might be. And another thing that I've always been fascinated by is why you haven't seen any attempt to shame, right? Um, shame had a lot to do with cigarettes becoming socially, uh, if not unacceptable, then less acceptable. Smoking inside, you, you know, you're, you're a bad dude if you, if you light up inside, right? Because, and there's shame associated with that because you are being seen as inconsiderate of others and possibly even uh, uh, self-destructive. So the same thing happened with gay rights. Um, it became seen as embarrassing and ultimately hateful to, to want to deny gay people rights. And I'm not saying that they've achieved full equality in the eyes of the law, um, but the, the measures that have been enacted, judicially or otherwise, those followed a period of social change where opposing gay marriage, uh, supporting discrimination on the, on the basis of uh, LGBTQ identity, using uh, derogatory words that used to be quite common, um, not just in schoolyards, all of those things became subjects of shame. And I'm, I, to be honest, just as, as, uh, as someone who does not own a gun, um, I've always been a little mystified by the, the fact that gun ownership hasn't been the subject of a shame campaign by any of the major uh, gun control groups. Um, I personally, you know, if I hear that someone has bought a gun, I'm, I'm kind of shocked and, and appalled by that. Uh, I find it disappointing if I know the person. And I'm not, I'm not saying there aren't potential exceptions, but I think some of the exceptions that we used to have, well, I do it for sport, uh, you know, I, it's, for, it's just a hobby, it's for fun, um, I, you know, I'm a collector, whatever it might be. There's a whole group of excuses or reasons, if you want to be kind about it, that I think once made more sense than they do today, right? Because you can't, you can't pursue gun ownership and gun collecting in, in a social vacuum anymore, right? We all understand that by perpetuating that market, by supporting the gun makers, by, by keeping alive a culture of healthiness around guns, you're, you're making it, you're helping contribute to it being socially acceptable, which in turn facilitates it being, you know, seen as okay for people to sell them, market them, make them, buy them. So um, I'm not going to weigh in on where I think that line ought to be. I'm just sort of voicing my surprise as, as an observer that we haven't seen more of an effort to literally uh, attach shame to gun ownership. Um, so, and, and I say this as someone who's done some reporting on the gun companies and some of the big uh, uh, equity funds and, you know, private hedge funds and all this, they are concerned about that. That's a vulnerability. In fact, I did some reporting on how um, the, the publicly held companies, right, when they file statements with the SEC, they're supposed to identify so that stockholders and potential stockholders are aware of them, risks associated with the stock including the idea of public shame, especially after their products are used in mass shootings. Uh, and so they are aware of this, um, if not the gun companies themselves sometimes, and their major investors, because as I reported at the time, some of the gun companies don't report anything along those lines. They, they totally leave out the risk factors, even though it's pretty clear they're aware of them. Um, but the major institutional investors, they're definitely aware of them. So it's already a, a potential pressure point. So, which again, goes back to why I'm a little bit surprised that no one seems to have 
tried a concerted campaign to apply that pressure. Um, let's see. Uh, DLJ says, here an Islamic country, we have the Quran, the last word of God. The Torah, by contrast, is the first word of God. Implication, the U.S. Constitution is treated by many as a holy scripture. Uh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure I'm following your theological path there, but I think you have a good point about the Constitution. Um, the irony, of course, being that the Constitution has within it the mechanism for changing itself. And there's a lot of evidence, I think, that the Founding Fathers expected that to be part of the American project, the idea that we would continually need to revise things. They were on the cusp of the Industrial Revolution. They saw, they saw that change was coming. They were, they were enacting change. The, the entire American experiment was a dramatic change in the way government was going to be done. So they didn't think, yeah, we nailed it. They were very aware that they had just screwed it up with the Articles of Confederation, what, like 10 years before. So the the project of governance was to them a very fluid thing and they were still trying to figure out what are the best ways of doing this the supreme court didn't become the supreme court as we knew it to know it today until marbury versus madison right so the their expectation right if you want to go by original intent of the of the founding fathers the original intent was to ignore original intent um, Daniel Pikulski says, Barack Obama is the Constitution expert. Get B.O. Barack Obama to lead the movement and generational shift. I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that would work or, or, uh, or how it would work, but it's, it's hard not to wonder what that would look like, right? Imagine if someone, um, imagine if both of the Obamas and the Clintons, right? Imagine if those four people uh, got out there, or George W. Bush, right? Why not? Uh, got out there and said, um, you know, America used to be a frontier, a constantly expanding frontier where, uh, you know, put whatever, you know, glossy spin you want to on the way America <laughs> got its land, right? Um, but you can acknowledge the myth of what gun ownership used to represent, right? The idea of hardy individuals defending themselves. That's not the world we live in anymore. In fact, the, I like to make the joke about the NRA is experiencing a lot of turmoil right now, claiming that they got ripped off by people, all of this stuff. In other words, they weren't able to defend themselves, right? This is the one, this is the, the raison d'etre for the group is to protect their right to defend themselves. They've got all the guns in the world and, uh, you know, according to them, I don't know who's accusing who of doing what, but according to them, like Ollie North in his 70s or whatever came in and walked out with however many hundreds of thousands of dollars. I don't, I don't know the specifics of the accusations, but I was told that you guys had the means to defend yourself. And that was the point. So if, uh, if gun ownership doesn't actually lead to net safety and the statistics are very clear that you're, you and your family become more susceptible to be violence, uh, victims of gun violence when you buy a gun than when you don't buy a gun. In other words, literally, the moment you bring that gun into your house, the odds that you or someone you care about is going to be the victim of gun violence, they go up dramatically. And part of that is because the opposite case, where you successfully defend yourself against an intruder with lethal intent, is so rare. And yet we've been conditioned to think it happens all the time, right? It's usually the Ollie Norths of our own organization who do it, in which case the, the, the guns that have been bought for the scenario of the home invasion are, are, are virtually never used successfully in that scenario. And that's not even including the, the cases where the home invader is a hardened criminal and takes the gun away from you and uses it on you. So, uh, it's tempting to wonder what that would look like, as you point out, if Obama were involved in that kind of movement, let alone had bipartisan support for it. And, and not just, you know, repealing the Second Amendment, but also attaching shame to it, right? Um, because it, 
and you can make a, a logical case for it. If you buy it for self-defense, you're buying into the notion that you're some kind of action hero and your home is under constant siege. And I'm not saying there aren't cases like, you know, DAs get threatened, right? That, that's a real thing. Cops get targeted. That's a real thing. So there are scenarios you can, you can contemplate where you would have carve-outs for people to potentially have, you know, weapons in their home for that kind of thing. But those are a tiny, tiny fraction of the gun, gun ownership culture that we're talking about. Most of it is, I, I shouldn't say most because I don't know the, have the hard numbers, but m most of it's either because guns are cool and I like shooting them or based on this fantasy of I'm going to protect my family, damn it. So, and you read, if you get the wires, you read every week, if not more so, uh, about kids shooting other kids because they found the gun that was, to protect, that was bought to protect them. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Um, Arcane Blue says, oh, I just, I just lost you. Uh, Arcane Blue says, former presidents are rarely politically active outside of elections for politicians of the same party. Kind of an unwritten rule. Um, sure, but so? So do it anyway, right? Um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, it's an unwritten rule, but a lot of our unwritten rules have been undone. So there's... There's no reason that the bad unwritten rules have to be followed uh, just because the uh, good unwritten rules are, are getting trashed. Uh, Arcane Blue says, because guns have been fetishized. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, let's see. So all of the, so you guys are putting forward a lot of uh, wonky prescriptions here, make all gun owners buy liability insurance, track ammo sales, put large tax on ammunition sales. Um, and I'm not saying that those would have no effect. I'm just, it's, it interests me as an observer that we don't have, um, most movements don't, don't, aren't built on such sort of incrementalist thinking. They're based on um, conceptual uh, upheaval. Right, the idea that something is bad or good, as opposed to well, we should impose a twenty percent tax on it. Um, and I'm not saying there's no place for that in a broader movement. I guess I'm just surprised that the conversation always seems to uh, devolve down to these incrementalist steps, many of which uh, end up being pointless anyway because they get challenged in court, and then then the Second Amendment comes into play. So I'm I'm a little curious as to what the thinking is, to, as to why that is, that we don't see a much more sort of maximalist approach to this, um, even from people who uh, ostensibly support it. Uh, Ian James Chapman says, we should have a national referendum process beyond the national convention. Uh, maybe. I don't know. Um, I mean, if nothing else, it certainly helps... Uh, show where popular opinion is, but we have polling and we already have polling. So it depends on a lot of the specifics of what the, what, what the referendum is, whether it's binding or not. Uh, John Keim, Keem, I'm not sure how to say your last name there, says HN shut down its website after Cloudflare said it will no longer provide services to HN. Yeah, I saw that. It looks like um, they're back in business though already because apparently another uh, web server, uh, you know, raised their hand and said, we'll protect you from uh, denial of service attacks. So uh, it doesn't look like that's any kind of long-term solution. And that's, and that's, to me, is kind of the fascinating thing that I'm curious to see how it'll play out given the political dynamics of Dayton versus El Paso is it's the first two amendments up against each other, right? Uh, people on the right and the left um, on both sides are, are in agreement that speech, political speech, can incite violence, right? Uh, and it certainly seems as though there's cause to suspect that that was true on both sides of the aisle with these weekend shootings. Um, and and it's, it's, it's the tension between those two, right? Do you take away the speech that incites the violence or do you take away the guns that make the violence possible on the scale that it now is? 
that to me is an interesting one. And I'll, I'll show my cards a little bit and say, you know, as a journalist, I'm something of a First Amendment absolutist. Uh, plus, if the president is one of the most egregious offenders of political speech, and we've just been told that he can't be indicted, what are you going to do about it, right? So it does seem that the First Amendment stuff is a little bit of a non-starter at the moment. Um, but I do think in some ways, and, and I'll, be, I'll be clear that I, I the, the idea that, I forget who said it, but someone said in the chat just now that guns are fetishized. I do think that potentially all of this is doable even without repealing the Second Amendment. If, you, if, they were to, if guns were to become the object of widespread, uh, profound shame, embarrassment, all of that, Lysistrata level stuff, uh, I think you would sh see a big change. I think you would see institutional investors reluctant to put money there. I think you would see stores like Dick's and probably Walmart um, be much more reluctant to stock them. Uh, and uh, it wouldn't go away entirely, but again, most of the gun violence that this country suffers from is not these high-profile shootings. These high-profile mass murders by gun certainly deserve our attention to the fullest, uh, but if only because of the effect they have, not just on the people killed, but on the country, right? These, this, is, this is terrorism. This is terrorism. And that's, that's something we ought to deal with. But in terms of the number of people dying by guns, it's not, um, it's mostly, largely not by these high profile mass shootings. Um, let's see what else we have here, guys. Bernie, Bernie Johan says, ban all semiotic rifles and start buying them back. Well, I, I'm not sure you can ban them. I, I don't remember the, the exact contours of the ban that, that uh, President Bush let expire, but uh, the statistics are pretty clear that, that the number of people killed with those kinds of weapons went down when there was a ban on them and went up when there wasn't. So availability has a pretty clear correlation to um, their use in in the criminal in a criminal way. So, um, whatever you can do without the first without repealing the Second Amendment seems to have an effect, and we see it even from state to state. Right, that's a fairly common correlation. I think they've found that tougher gun control laws mean fewer um, fewer deaths by guns. And I don't know to what extent anyone's challenged whether that's causal or not, but it certainly seems to be a correlation. Uh, Devon Miller says, how can they use the Second Amendment if it was meant for a well-formed militia? Well, because no one cares what it's meant for. What, what matters is how it can be interpreted. And starting back in the 70s, there was a concerted effort to interpret it differently, to, to redound to individual gun ownership. And that's become enshrined in our law, whether we like it or not, whether that's what the founders intended or not. And so if they, if they succeed in twisting the, uh, the interpretation of the Second Amendment to mean that, you can either somehow, within the law, twist that interpretation back to what you think is the original amendment or take away the thing that's being interpreted, right? If there's, if there's no right to it, period, in the law, then there's nothing to interpret. So, um, you know, you, the, the gun control opponents can spend the next generation fighting that interpretation or twisted interpretation of the Second Amendment. Um, and they might even win, but then it just takes one Supreme Court ruling and, you, and you're back with the, the other interpretation. Uh, Eric R. says, I'm from El Paso, and Arcane Blue says, stay strong, Eric. Um, yeah, I mean, that that's uh, it's it's not clear to me what to say to someone from a city who's gone through something like that, uh, except that to offer the same platitudes that everyone else gets yelled at. But I will say that I hope that staying strong also means not acting out of fear. It's one thing to do things to to make things better, 
but to do it because we're afraid is that's that's what it looks like when terrorism wins that's literally what terrorism is to make you act out of fear so uh to no one no one who's gone through something like this needs people telling them what to do whether it's stay strong or stay brave but uh i hope you can do both and i hope you will lean on um us our interaction the our community the folks here your community at home um i think it it is important to know that there are people out there who care and want to hear what you're going through so um stay strong stay unafraid and stay connected stay connected to other people uh let's see the tall 4204 says discuss the veracity of indiscriminate shootings be more based on the effect of socioeconomic factors and access to guns can you think of any instance that any perpetrator say making over 75,000 a year so off the top of my head no i cannot but if i recall correctly the vegas shooter was uh retired and well off um so uh, i may be wrong about that but i don't think there's a, a lot of evidence that it's poor people buying $500 assault rifles and and going uh berserk on crowds of innocent people unknown to them um so you know the, the the i don't i don't think there's and when you say any perpetrator say making over $75,000 a year that's that's a fairly high number and it tends to be achieved when you've when you've got a settled life where you've decided you're willing to make the compromises to show up at work in the morning and get ahead in your career and eat all whatever shit you're required to eat in your chosen career to get ahead so the the people we're talking about are often young men who wouldn't necessarily be in that cohort of being eligible to make that kind of money anyway but uh in terms of the people fostering this culture a lot of them are quite well off thank you very much in part because of fostering the culture and again if i'm wrong i hope someone will correct me but i'm pretty sure that the vega shooter uh was quite comfortable thank you mr don says you seem to be advocating for the repeal of the second amendment as a solution to gun violence do you think that's a realistic goal given the number of states that would have to ratify it so i don't know that i'm advocating for it it's not my intention to advocate for it i guess i'm just trying to say i'm a little mystified that no one is everyone whether they support or oppose gun laws says well second amendment so if you if you support the second amendment i'm surprised that more people politicians aren't asked why and interrogated about those beliefs why they think the second amendment is worth x number of people dying every year and if you oppose if you support gun control laws then it's it's unclear to me why you're not working to undo the second amendment and it, you're right it is it is an unrealistic goal but that hasn't stopped us before right i mean we as i mentioned earlier we see radical shifts in what we consider realistic or unrealistic pretty quickly um i mentioned gay rights i mentioned smoking even the idea that uh there's a right to healthcare is is relatively new and but came about pretty quickly and i'm not saying that everyone agrees to that certainly there are certain there are some people at the moment who still say if you can't afford healthcare you need to go out and get a job so you can and if you can't well then you suffer the consequences but just in the course of the obamacare battle we saw a lot of people sort of come around to the notion including republicans that no of course if you have a pre pre-existing condition you shouldn't be denied healthcare right that that happened almost instantly so a lot of these things seem unrealistic i think before they're they're really examined in the light of day and if if proponents of uh repeal put forward something in its place or suggested what what it might look like on the back end um then you know maybe that makes a difference or maybe it doesn't maybe it's just a clean you know what we've decided that no you don't have a right to buy a gun anymore doesn't mean you can't just means you don't have a constitutionally protected right it's not your right anymore you can you can there may still be avenues to do it 
just you know all the all the analogies are are cliche albeit helpful ones by now right buying a car you know you don't have a you don't have a god-given right to get in a car and drive down the road you have to go through certain hoops and there's no constitutional right that you can appeal to 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 defend that so um, if and, and and the other thing I would say is that Republicans already campaign every four years on Democrats are coming to take your guns and as we've seen with socialism when you're already painted that way there's very little downside to actually doing it and there's the potential upside of exciting the people who actually want you to do it you go out and get people's guns so um, that it is unrealistic now but it doesn't necessarily have to stay that way anyway uh, with that I'm gonna um, say goodbye and, and uh, wish you all well and, and hope that you're all taking care of each other and, and um, thinking good thoughts and trying to give everyone the benefit of the doubt here and uh, act in good faith. It's very easy when we're scared and worked up to be um, to want to honor the, the magnitude, the enormity of what's happened by, by adopting maximalist stances towards people, towards ideas and all of that. I think it's important that um, we try to keep an even keel, right? Terrorism's job is to make us act afraid, so let's not act afraid. We can feel it. It's okay to feel it. It's okay to express it. Let's try not to act on it. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll thank you again, as always, for checking out our conversation here every weekday at TYTI Daily. I'll ask you to Subscribe if you don't already to us here on YouTube. Like and follow us on Facebook so you can see our original reporting when we have that up. And um, uh, hopefully you'll you'll check out TYTI Daily, featuring not just myself but also senior investigative reporter Ken Klippenstein. Uh, on a sporadic basis, we go back and forth on these. So thanks again. Take care of yourselves.